Good morning and welcome to the Costain Group PLC Q&A session relating to the 2023 full year results. Throughout this recorded Q&A session, investors will be in listen-only mode. Questions are encouraged and should be submitted using the Q&A tab situated on the right-hand corner of your screen. Simply type in your questions and press send. The company may not be in a position to answer every question it receives during the meeting itself. However, the company can review all questions submitted today and publish responses where it is appropriate to do so. Before we begin, I would like to submit the following poll. And I would now like to hand you over to Investor Relations Director, Paul Sharma. Good morning to you. Good morning and uh, thank you very much. And welcome to the Investor Meet uh, question and answer session. And um, with me today, I have uh, Alex Fawn, the CEO, and Helen Willis, the CFO. Uh, before we start, just a couple of things. Uh, you may have seen that we, we do publish our consensus now on the website, and we expect that to be uh, updated uh, next week once we have the results uh, from some of the more of the analysts um, uh, to come through to me. And secondly, I'd like to, to go through to slide two and just note that we have uh, a cautionary statement. Uh, this is also on page 33 of the presentation and also on our RNS. Um, so now I'd like to pass through to uh, Alex Vaughan, who is our uh, CEO for some introductory statements, and they'll be followed by Helen Willis, uh, our CFO. And Alex will be covering uh, some of the uh, top line uh, points from yesterday and also our preferred book and order book status. And Helen will be covering off some of the issues regarding the pension. Thank you, Alex. Thank you, Paul, and uh, good morning, everyone. Thank you very much for taking the time to join this call, and we look forward to receiving uh, any questions that you may have. Um, if, I, if I just sort of reflect on the results for um, 2023, you know, we're really pleased with the continued momentum that we've built in the business over the last few years. Um, it's another strong financial performance for the business, and it is ahead of the market estimates um, that were out there. And if we look at it from an adjusted operating um, business point of view, which I think is the right measure to look at the underlying performance of the business, we've had a 10.5% increase in the operating profits of 40.1 million. Um, we've now broken through the 3% delivering um, on a margin basis, adjusted operating margin of 3%, and we're on track to meet the margin targets that we published um, for 2024 and 2025. And I think something that's a real feature of the business today has been the cash generation, and we've had a 30%, which is a 40.6 million increase in the net cash balance of the business, and the business now enjoys uh, having a cash balance of 164.4. So a really strong set of results, and I think, with that momentum, we look forward with a lot of confidence to the future of the business. We have a forward workload, um, which is now three times um, the revenue um, that we have on the annualized revenue of the business. We've had a number of notable wins, extensions and growth on secured frameworks um, that gives us a really positive outlook uh, across, across the whole business. Um, and we're very busy tendering work at the moment. So, you know, the Ford, the Ford momentum of the business is really growing. And if I look at, you know, what's exciting about the future is that Costain uh, is operating in critical long term investment markets. Um, and our markets represent the critical national needs that the UK has in order to drive economic growth, deliver positive social change and meet the de decarbonisation targets that the UK has. The National Infrastructure Commission recently published its um, second National Infrastructure Assessment that turned around and talked about the infrastructure that is critical to be invested in. Um, and the government recently published its construction pipeline, highlighting over £700 billion worth of investment over the next 10 years. Um, you know, and we've purposely positioned our business to work and deliver um, under those major investment programs and we've got good long-term visibility uh, in those markets so it's a really exciting space for us and um, we've made we've made some really good progress on some of the strategic priorities that we've got as a business if i look at that 3.9 billion pounds worth of work that we've got secured and the quality of the tech work that we're tendering at the moment it's of a really good quality lower risk higher margin and I think that's demonstrated by the fact that we're delivering 3% margins already 
today and we've set out the targets of, of where we're going. The group is also very positively positioned in significant growth markets. So if we look at water and energy, both of those are going to go through existential growth um, going forwards to meet the challenges that, um, that, that we have for them. And if you looked at that, that's only 28% of the business today. So we're, for, for us, it's going to become a very significant part of a larger business as we move forward and present um, you know, a very exciting opportunity for us. And we've also been very successful in building a much stronger, broader tier one customer mix, um, which brings great resilience and balance to the business. So we've been you know, rather than being very focused on an HS2 program, which is going really well for us, you know, we've been growing our positions with other customers, including Heathrow, um, Transport for London, um, Manchester Airports Group, just to name a few. So, you know, we are building a really strong, resilient and balanced business, and we're very excited um, with what's going to go ahead. So I look forward to any questions that, that you've got around that, but I'll hand over to Helen um, to talk about some of the financial highlights. Thanks, Alex. Good morning, everyone. Uh, so I'm just uh, focusing on uh, cash and, uh, and the pension, as Paul mentioned, and, and the impacts on, on dividend. And I uh, hope I can bring some clarity to that for you. But welcome any questions uh, if, if I haven't managed to do that. So um, on cash, uh, really strong performance uh, for the year, as Alex mentioned, 164.4 million cash at the end of FY23, 40 million up on the previous year end. Um, and that's split into two parts as uh, cash uh, that we hold in, in joint operations of £59 million, that is costing cash still, but it is held separately, uh, and £105 million of, of, of cash in, in our own bank accounts. Um, really consistent performance through the year. So we report average month end net cash, and uh, we've just introduced a new measure, measure of average weekend net cash. Um, and both of those are 141 million pounds. So you can see that that is is, is steady throughout throughout the year, uh, and and is a, a clear indication of how uh, consistently we pay our our suppliers, um, which is really important for us. And I pulled out in the presentation yesterday that we are still one of the top top fastest payers uh, in construction, and we, we we view that as very important um, for our supply chain, and and is a really key part of us. Um, securing the best possible supply chain uh, for, for the work that we do. So really strong cash uh, building uh, year on year. Uh, I'm, I'm really pleased with how that's how that is moving. Um, that of course strengthens the balance sheet and gives us plenty of options uh, in terms of where we would like to to invest uh, and indeed for dividend. So just moving on to dividend, we introduced uh, dividend at the half year. Uh, and we are uh, hoping to pay uh, 0.8 pence uh, the full year, as we announced. Um, there's a natural ceiling of about £3.3 million to the dividend. Uh, and this comes from something called dividend parity uh, with the pension scheme contributions. So I'll just, just explain what happened with the pension scheme negotiations this year and, and, and hence, hence this ceiling of 3.3. So we um, agreed the triennial valuation with a pension scheme during the summer of 23 uh, and uh, managed to significantly reduce the contributions from about 12 million to about 3 million pounds per annum. So that's a really nice uptick to our, our cash. Uh, and that uh, became effective in July of last year. So that in itself was, was a really good um, move forward. But uh, in, in years years gone by, um, we had agreed a dividend parity um, between the pension and the dividend, which means that any dividend paid um, must, must be matched with, uh, by contributions into the pension scheme. So at the minute we have annual contributions into the pension scheme of 3.3 million pounds, and therefore we're choosing to pay dividend uh, to the same level. Any additional dividend that we would pay would have to be matched into the pension scheme. Um, the really important point though for us is we also managed to agree an annual check uh, with the pension scheme. So each March there's a test that's done and if at the point of that test the scheme has tipped into an actuarial surplus and we believe we're close to that, 
the following year's payments to the pension scheme would pause, so we wouldn't have to pay the £3.3 million. Pounds. And importantly, the dividend parity for that uh, future year would pause, and therefore we wouldn't need to make any dividend matching payments into the pension scheme. And so that gives us much more flexibility uh, in, team, in terms of um, potentially increasing the dividend or potentially uh, thinking about other, other types of dividend. So that, that's a really important point for us. It gives us flexibility, um, but we will have to carry out that test every year. Um, I think that's probably all I'd like to pull out at this stage, but very happy to take any questions that might might help to give further clarity on, on that. I'm going to hand back to Paul. Great. Thank you, Alex. Ellen. So there's a, actually quite a few questions come in. So I'm really just going to start at the top on a chronological order and just work way down. So there's quite a few questions from John H. Uh, so first one was basically asking about um, given more than one billion of business secured for 24 and the volume of bidding and tendering you have. Um, you know, can we expect a revenue increase for 24? Well, thanks very much for the question, John. Um, we've certainly got a really good solid volume of work. Um, I think naturally um, we're probably expecting and guiding a slight reduction um, in revenue for 24. And that really is us being very cautious around, you know, as we move into the election, the sort of cycle around decision making and that we just we just feel that we need to be very prudent um, from that side however you know we do see um, operating profits prof, profits should increase um, and you know the opportunities are building that we'll then see um, as we get through then into the next parliament we'll have we'll have revenues increasing and also from john uh balfour Beatty's numbers are out this morning and they were discussing about uh uk power transmission and distribution starting in 25 they think that's a they think it's a good big growth area um you know do we think it's a growth area are we positioned in that area yeah John, again another great question and um we certainly see the whole energy space as a significant a growth market and you know yesterday we saw the government make announcements around gas um, energy generation and you know costain's core capability has come around from gas process engineering and we're very active uh, with BP on carbon capture um, and then, you know, working with another number of energy companies around hydrogen. And, and we certainly see opportunities in the electrical transmission market as well. So I think that marketplace is very exciting. We're very well placed and we look forward to taking advantage of the opportunities there. So this is really a question for Helen. Uh, it's on the operating margin. So uh, the second half operating margin adjusted was 3.8. Um, we basically said we're going to be achieving a run rate of uh, 3.5 during FY24. So basically, any reason why we can't be getting 3.5, and and this John didn't ask this question, but some analysts have been asking, you know, uh, can we beat 3.5 in, in FY24? Um, thanks, thanks, to John. Um, it is absolutely the question. We we issued the milestones uh, this time last year and keen to. Uh, show our confidence in in the margin progression and um, we did use the, the terminology of, of three and a half percent during FY24 and four and a half percent during FY25 clearly that's a run rate um, yes we, we hit 3.8 in the second half of, of, of FY23 but I think it's important to note that the half one half two split typically we will uh, recognize um, more more profit and 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 hence higher margin in the second half of any any year as as we uh, move through the year and are progressively more confident in in contract outturns. So I think it's important to look at the FY23 full year number of three percent and compare that to the milestone of of three and a half. But I guess uh, what I take from it is that we are doing all the right things to move us up up that margin um, walk. Uh, and, and and moving in the right direction and three and a half percent during FY24 feels for feel, absolutely feels achievable. Uh, this is another question for Helen. Um, we're talking about one-off costs. So basically we had 30, 30 million of transformation uh, costs, etc. in 23. Um, this is say obviously we report both adjusted and, and, and reported uh, EBIT. Mm -hmm. um, FY24 there's going to be five million of transformation restructuring costs that's in the RNS. So the question is, assuming that's the case, will the statutory accounts for 24 be much more aligned 
to adjusted figures than they were in 23? Um, the answer to that is yes. Uh, so we have pulled out the adjusting items um, as for 22 and FY23 on page 10 of the presentation, just, just for your information and, and in the RNS. Um, we've been driving the transformation programme over uh, the last two years and FY24 will be the last year of it. As Paul mentioned, we've we've pulled out in the RNS that we expect about five million pounds of, of adjusting items as we as we come to this final year of the transformation. Um, and therefore the difference between the adjusted profit number and the reported will be that five million uh, and, and therefore much closer. When we get to FY25, uh, they should be um, very, very tightly aligned. We, we, we anticipate that those adjusting items will be um, absolutely minimal. So the next question is also from John H. Um, uh, Helen did cover this in her, her, her uh, kind of intro, but maybe we're just asking this again. Um, is it correct the review of the pension level for the pension scheme is due to be funded imminently? And, and the answer to that one is, is, is yes. Uh, if so, should the funding level exceed the 101% threshold, is there a prospect of a special DV uh, given the suddenly low share price? So if, if we do exceed and tip into actual surplus, it gives us scope to consider uh, those options. And that will be something that we will discuss uh, as a board. And we absolutely recognise um, the, the, uh, the importance of coming back and talking about that. Yep. And this is really a follow on question is now from, from Daniel D. Uh, in the probable event that the surplus scheme is in surplus, can you talk about the capital allocation priorities in terms of dividends versus buybacks? So if we are in surplus and we've got a pension holiday, um, you know, would we choose to basically do some, well, do nothing, uh, do a buyback or, or, or do a special divvy? So our capital allocation policy, we're, we're, we're very clear that we um, are prioritising investing in the business to drive our strategy and our growth. Um, and uh, that's demonstrated, for example, by the investment in the in the transformation as we've been talking about. Um, we are spending capex as well as we as we digitize the company. So we are investing in ourselves in, in that regard. Uh, and we, of course, we've reintroduced the dividend. Um, so we are making sure we're considering how we how we allocate our capital across all of those requirements. If we tip into surplus, obviously that that will allow us to 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 think again in terms of of, uh, of dividend um, away from this natural ceiling that we currently have as a 3.3. And this is a really more for Alex. So when Alex stands up, uh, he discusses um, you know how the world of business is doing and the activity we're seeing. Um, can we give us some idea of when you, you might see some contract wins? We, we see uh, uh, contract wins from Keir and Gal for try. So you know. What, what cadence of RNSs do we expect to see you know, from now till the till next results, basically? Yeah, a really good question. And um, look, we've we've obviously made some announcements on some wins um, sort of this year uh, or last year, um, which which has been really pleasing. But I think you know we expect to be making further announcements. So over the next six months, we should be making announcements around energy, the progress that we're making now. Um, around Ampate in water, uh, building on the Northumbrian water win that we had um, at the beginning of this year. Um, and also then, you know, looking at um, some of the rail projects that we're tendering at the moment and, and the fact that we're in the procurement cycle on those. So we would expect a number of announcements to come through. I think it's also, you know, one of the other things that we're very good at is that we unlock um, opportunities from the frameworks that we've already secured. So we've got a large number of frameworks that we've secured and we are every single month unlocking opportunities from those that we don't publicly um, disclose. So, you know, contracts for people like Transport for London, for Heathrow Airport, you know, people like that, you know, we're unlocking that. So, um, but to come back to your question, you know, you can expect as we come through the next six months to see a number of awards coming through. Uh, next one is from Colin C. Uh, so given the adjusted operating profit increase of 10.5% and the significant net cash balance increase, uh, what specific strategies or initiatives do you attribute these to? And how do you plan to sustain or enhance these results moving forward? I mean, it's one for Helen, but just to say also, as I mentioned in my intro, um, we will be doing a publishing consensus are uh, probably middle of next week, towards the end of next week. Now we'll give you some 
some more numbers to kind of hang your hat on as well that one there so I guess the uh, the top top line, um, Alex has, has just spoken to some of the sort of in interesting, exciting opportunities as we as we um, work through uh, our work winning and bidding um, and building the order book for the for the future. Uh, in terms of the profit and the margin, we've been working very hard over the last few years to to drive operational excellence through the business and and uh, much better risk management and assurance. And I think you can see. The, the, the sort of proof point of that is is the improving margin to um, to three percent and and three and a half percent in the second half. So everything we're doing is um, improving the performance in in our contracts and uh, controlling our costs and and hence uh, hence the forty point one of adjusted operating profit and that that ten and a half percent increase. So we will continue that work, which will um, uh, drive us forward in in uh, in, in better operational excellence um, in more efficiencies, uh, being more effective and hence hence pushing the margin up and and indeed the operating uh, profit in due course. And we do have to be wary of the, the timing of some of the contracts and so on and, and hence the shape of, of the top line that we've we've talked about. Uh, and you will see some uh, the, the consensus coming through as Paul said that will give you some more clarity on that. But we absolutely think this is just this is just oh I can't speak sustainable <laughs> uh this is from mark ellis for helen uh can be clear with the, with the cash balance how much is unencumbered group cash uh, contract prepayments and how much is needed to give customers comfort and confidence in the business in the long term so um so how much cash is unencumbered uh how much is contract uh, prepayments um and how much is needed to give customers comfort uh, you know, in, in the business, what cash level do we need to think we need to have, basically? So uh, the cash is is unencumbered, um, apart from the joint operations cash, as I as I already mentioned. Um, it's uh, it's our cash. It's on deposit. We're earning interest from it. Um, there aren't prepayments. We we do call out in the um, in the presentation and the RNS some working capital positive timing differences of about twenty five million pounds. But that really is just the difference between uh, receipts and payments on a, on a fairly regular basis. I think the shape of of, um, of the industry has changed over the years, and um, and what was more typical a number of years ago with advanced payments is is not not no longer the case. Um, so that cash is our cash. Um, our balance sheet is 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 very strong. Um, certainly throughout my tenure of three years, uh, the balance sheet and the and the levels of cash hasn't hasn't um, curtailed any bidding activity. So we, we, are, we are absolutely in the right place and unable to uh, think about where we use that cash as, as I was just mentioning earlier. Uh, this is from Nigel Lane. This is also a working capital question. So the year end cash position was enhanced by working capital. As, as Helen mentioned, we've got 25 million of, of, uh, of working capital positive uh, working capital there. Are you able to quantify how much would have been on a usual working capital position are there any plans to return some shareholders uh, to cash, given the large amount of cash we have in the business? And that also probably relates to the question of uh, the dividend matching scheme as well, doesn't it? it absolutely. So, um, so I think if you if you look at that cash balance, the, the month end and, and weekend average cash of 141, I suppose that, that sort of gives you a clear indication uh, of, of uh, cash levels throughout the year. Um, absolutely, it's it's uh, the the point that we have. Um, a very strong balance sheet. We have strong, strong cash balance. We've repaid our term loan, um, so we are able to think about where we use that cash. But there is this sort of natural ceiling, as I mentioned at the outset, of 3.3, which is the annual contribution into the pension scheme. Um, if if we were to pay more dividend than that, we would have to put more contribution into the pension scheme, and 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 and, and that would be that would be uh, that would be sunk. Um, so absolutely, we can think about uh, the level of a dividend and we can think about buyback and, and specials, but that will be something the board needs to consider uh, as and when we do tip into surplus. Uh, this is one for Alex, that's from Stephen Kay. Uh, the forward work position is described as high quality at around three times FY23 revenue. Can you discuss the criteria used to evaluate the quality of the work and how this forward work aligns with the long-term strategic goals especially concerning diversification and risk management? Yes, yeah, even good question. Um, yeah, so look, in how we evaluate that, um, 
you know, we have a look at the sort of risk profile. So, you know, we've made a lot of changes um, over the years um, to set very strict criteria about the type of work that we're willing to sign up for. Um, so therefore, as we go through governance um, on every single tender, we're making sure that the, the risk profile of the work that we've got and the returns that we also demand from that work meet the strategic criteria of the business in terms of the forward direction. And that's why that, that's what gives us the confidence to be able to turn around um, and say that we're, well, we're highly confident. I think coming back, a lot of that forward order, forward work of 3.9 billion um, is what underpins the future and, and a lot of that will drive the growth. I, I, I didn't say at the start, but also that excludes about 50 frameworks that we've got, which are consultancy frameworks. So they're zero value. And every year we secure um, commissions under those frameworks, which is over and above the order book. And, and that is at the higher margin consultancy work. So that's how that comes through. So I think that also then gives us the added the added. Um, layer that will help us drive those margins at, at, a, at a really high level. So this is a question, uh, I think, for Alex from Daniel D. Um, there were a lot of takeovers in the UK in the last 18 months. Uh, cost stain should be an obvious takeover target. Uh, what's the impediment to you getting taken out? And do you think that impediment still exists today? Yeah, thanks, Daniel. Um, well, look, let me just look at what how we're approaching how we're approaching this. Look, our job as the leadership team running this amazing business is um, to run it as well as anyone can run it. So we're running it very, very hard. And that's about, you know, delivering excellent services to the customers that we work for, um, securing good volumes of the right type of work, positioning the business really well for growth in the future and capturing that growth and delivering, you know, really strong returns by, being as efficient as we can in how we run the business, investing to make the business better um, and delivering, you know, delivering those margins. So that's our single minded focus, um, you know, and that ought to be the focus of any business is making sure that we're running our business as hard as possible. Therefore, if, if anyone was able was to pop up and was interested, then, you know, it would be good value for the shareholders. Uh, this is, I think, one for Helen. Um, with the just operating uh, margin targets of uh, FY20 of, of 3.5 during 24 and uh, 4.5 during 25, what are the key risks and challenges do you see in achieving those targets, and uh, what measures do you have in place to mitigate them? So we have been driving um, improvements through through the business as we've talked about, and and, and that really is what underpins the, those two margin targets. So working very hard on um, excellent delivery, working very hard to be more efficient, more effective, and to manage risk uh, at a contract level, uh, and therefore as at a portfolio level, we sort of aggregate all of those contracts, knowing that we are. Uh, driving margin improvement. Um, alongside that, we've been investing in, in in other skills and capabilities, and and looking at our cost base overall to 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 uh, maximise the benefits from from that, get get full value from it. So the the risk is 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 absolutely about operational delivery, and that's what we work very hard on every day. And we've been investing in 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 the right right people and right skills to to drive that very hard. So we're, we're very confident uh, that we're moving in the right direction. Uh, there's two questions on cash. There's one from Massimo A and Stephen K. So I'm just going to put them together about, if you don't, if you don't mind. So um, how much, you've got a lot of cash. Um, how much can we consider the surplus cash, if any? So basically how much cash you need to run the business? How much could be distributed to shareholders? Should that be allowed? And this also really similar question from Stephen K. Uh, could you elaborate on the on the considerations regarding you know dividends, M and A, surplus cash shareholders? Um, so I think the real question is you know how much cash do you need to run the business for that surplus cash? You know what's what's your uh, uh, um, list for you know shopping list for dividends, special buybacks, M and A, etc. Um, so I think we have we have more than, more than enough cash to, to to run the business. As we've been saying, the cash generation has been very very strong over the last couple of years. <coughs> Uh, and and the level now at 164.4, and you know we, we plan for that to increase 
uh, in in 24 and beyond uh, it means that we do we do have surplus cash in, in my mind um, we've talked about um, the investments we're already planning in terms of, of, of people and skills in terms of uh, digitizing ourselves in terms of the recommitment you know returning to dividends we did at the half year um, how much is surplus? I think if you there's a chart on slide 14 of the, of the um, presentation, and that shows you that there isn't um, there isn't a very significant swing through the year, uh, and that that gives you some some feeling for um, the peaks and troughs, I guess, on cash. Um, so I think we have we do have surplus cash. We do absolutely um, uh, think about where we where we would like to use that and where best to use that as we drive the strategy and drive the growth that Alex has been been talking about. So I think it really does come down to um, the, the ceiling that the pension scheme uh, uh, sort of I, I won't say imposed, but but uh, gives us the 3.3. I think the the uh, we will think about dividend levels. We will think about buybacks and specials, but but really uh, for us it it would be when when we don't have to make the dividend matching into the pension scheme. Uh, so this is another question from Helen, uh, from Daniel D. Can you give an approximation of how much your revenue in EBIT comes from consultancy? Um, have you thought about uh, splitting off consultancy, report either reporting it separately or having it as a, as a separate business? So we have considered all of, all of that, um, absolutely. Uh, we've done a lot of work over the last couple of years to uh, to, to be very clear on our strategy uh, uh, on consultancy. Um, we've restructured digital um, at the half year and, and really honed in on, on what those digital consultancy services are as well. So we have a, a really clear proposition and, and, and uh, that is offered to our customers across all of our, our sectors. Uh, so there's a mix of services that we're providing into our customers, and I think it's a continuum um, across the sort of life cycle of, of, of any customer thinking about uh, where we provide consultancy, where we might partner to, to help our customers with delivery, where we provide cost, uh, construction um, uh, complex pro program delivery. So it's, it's really a continuum of services that we provide to the customer. Where we organise ourselves is is by by division, by customer and sector, uh, and hence that's the way we report. Uh, but we absolutely drive drive the the business um, through those different service lines, and uh, a really key part of our margin progression is is to drive the volume of consultancy uh, to to our customer base um, through through the uh, you know the, the next few years, so that uh, that you you will see that coming to fruition through the margin improvement. Alex, I think you might want to build on that. Yeah, no, just uh, absolutely everything that Helen said is, is is where we're at. But I think just in terms of coming back to the separating, separate, and running it as a separate business, you know, what we sell as consultants is costing people, and those are the same costing people that will be delivering major programs, contracts as a contractor, as they are a consultant. So, you know, the real value is the is the core expertise that we have of, of people in this business. It's just how we go to market and sell those skills and that expertise is, is different when we come through a consultancy proposition. So actually to really grow it and leverage it, it's really important that it remains part of the core business. And as Helen said, you know, we're organized around our customers and it's making sure that we really understand what our customers needs and are able to, to help meet those through you know, that broader proposition. Um, this is off uh, from Nigel M. I, th I think we've covered this before, but it's worth going go over again. Um, is there any consideration of buyback given the uh, market value of the business? Uh, absolutely. Uh, so buyback specials, level of dividend, absolutely all, all in our consideration. Uh, but as, as I mentioned earlier, uh, until we've tipped into that actuarial surplus, uh, it's not something that we would likely do because we would have to, to match into the pension scheme. Uh, this is uh, from Massimo for Alex. Um, so is inflation, materials, labour, etc. still a risk in business or do contracts protect us from inflation spikes? And just actually to add, Massimo didn't ask this, but we were asked this on the road show. Um, you know, is, 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 there, is there a shortage of people at the moment as well? So in the market? Yeah, like I think I think two, um, two strong 
two strong issues for um, uh, for us all, actually. So inflation, I think inflation does present um, a bit of a challenge because it's a challenge to our customers and the confidence that they have in what the cost of their investment is going to be. Um, now, positively, it's it's much more predictable um, and foreseeable at the moment. So we're able to help them think about their budgeting and forecasting that gives them that predictability of the outcome. Um, in terms of our contract risk, all of our contracts have protection for inflation, so we're not exposed. But as I say, you know, this has put quite a burden on um, our customers' budgets when they're not able to get the same um, return from all same budgets from some of the government departments. So, you know, it remains. And it, and it really comes back to how if we can work with them collaboratively, we can drive a much more um, value engineering, better solutions to be able to help offset um, the budget pressures that they feel from, from inflationary prices. But as I say, it's much more it's much more stable at the moment, which is good. And we're totally protected as a business. Coming back to the labor piece, I think um, we've had a lot of questions on this. Um, we're not, we are certainly not struggling with um, recruiting exceptionally talented people into the business and attracting some of the best suppliers um, to want to work with us and support us, which is, which is fantastic. I think the benefit that we have is the type of work that we do and the fact that we work on long-term programs, you know, we're talking about five years and in some cases, 12 years visibility, that gives us the ability to turn around and attract people with them having strong confidence of the forward workload. And one of the things that we've done coming up the transformation program is that we're investing a lot more money now in developing the skills, expertise and, and competencies of our team to help them develop their careers at the same time, including the number of apprentices and graduates that we recruit. So, you know, it's a it's a point that we take very seriously. That we're putting a lot of a lot of effort in, but it's not holding us back and we don't foresee it holding us back at the moment. Um, this is from John H. Uh, so beyond 25, will further growth and profitability be driven by revenue or driven by margin growth? So if so, does the company have the resources, particularly human, to grow or will you need M&A bolt-ons to basically you know, capture the growth 25 onwards? Yeah, look, I think, I, I think coming back to the answer to that question, it, it's going to be a mix of both. You know, we're going to grow. Um, we're going to grow our revenues because, as I, as I spoke about at the start, if you look at the opportunities ahead and the opportunities in this marketplace for us to deliver economic growth for the UK, positive social change and meeting our decarbonisation targets are absolutely there. Um, so we will get top line growth, but the quality of what we're doing, and as Helen says, growing the consultancy growing our consultancy business and continuing to improve, you know, the effectiveness and efficiency and performance of our business is all going to add to the bottom line um, as well. So that's, you know, that's pretty, that's pretty exciting for us and, and the opportunities are significant. Our uh, last one is at the moment from uh, Daniel D. And I, I might actually have a crack at this myself, if you don't mind. Um, so considering the share price, why not announce a strategic review to unlock shareholder value? Um, as a Daniel, I think, I mean, uh, I, you know, I've been in the city now, what, 25 years, and um, a strategic review is normally cut a company code for these problems. And really, you know, really, this company is not in the situation where we would actually need to announce a strategic review. I mean, we agree it's undervalued, but um, strategic review is not normally uh, the uh, you know, route taken at this point. And I think that is it. So I'm going to pass over to uh, Alex to wrap up. Yeah, look, thanks very much for um, thanks very much again for taking the time to join this call. I hope you found it um, useful. Um, and thanks for a series of great questions. Um, there's a lot of consistency with the questions that have been asked here with what we're getting from from uh, the wider market, which is great and things that we're very focused on. I think I'll just come back to that we're really pleased with the momentum and it's another strong financial performance of the business and you know we're confident that that will continue to be a trend that we continue we've got a really high quality forward workload for the business and we've got we're excited in the opportunities ahead 
the markets that we've positioned ourselves in and the customers we're working for are absolutely the right markets and the right customers because that's where long-term strategic investment is going to be made and we're making really good progress on the strategic priorities for the business so exciting times ahead and we look forward to um, keeping you updated so thank you very much for taking the time to join the call and have a good rest of your day Perfect. Alex, Helen, Paul, thank you very much indeed for updating investors today. Could I please ask investors not to close this session as you will now be automatically redirected to provide your feedback in order that the board can better understand your views and expectations. This will only take a few moments to complete and I'm sure will be greatly valued by the company. On behalf of the management team of Costain Group PLC, we'd like to thank you for attending today's presentation and good morning to you all.